Hello and welcome to Three Things. This is the Thais informal chat show where we get to know all the wonderful folks who make up our West Coast publication. My name is Emma Cooper. I am the outreach manager here at the Thai, and it's been my pleasure and privilege to get to, again, chat, pick people's brains and kind of find out what drives and motivates everyone to do what they do. So thank you so much for tuning in on Zoom, Facebook, or YouTube, wherever you're watching. If you've got any questions for our guest today, which is our editor-in-chief, Robin Smith, please ask them early in our 30-minute conversation so that we get a chance to try our best to answer them. So do, do that in the, uh, the question and answer on Zoom or in the comments on Facebook and YouTube. And we are live broadcasting at a distance pandemic life uh, on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the Tsleil-Waututh Youth First Nations. And I, like I said, we get to chat with Robin Smith today. She, uh, she was, she, Robin is someone who wants to do the work. She doesn't want to talk about doing the work. So I feel this is a get, even though this is someone in our own organization. Uh, and Robin has a great history with the Thai. She started here as an intern in 2011 and started working, editing other interns work and quickly progressed through the organization to become our editor in chief in 2015. So with Jeanette Aitchison, our publisher, um, she is leading our organization and we're going to talk about the past, present and future of the TAI from her perspective. So please welcome to the online stage, it's Robin Smith. Hello. Great. Yes, that was great. We've been working on those jazz hands. You nailed it. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Stuck the landing and I love it. Perfect. Well. Before we get going, I just kind of wanted to hear about when you showed up out of uh, UBC School of Journalism as an intern at the TAI, uh, and I know really mentoring interns is a big focus of your work as our editor, what was sort of the landscape that you stumbled into in 2011? Tell us like a little bit what was happening. Yeah, that was, so it was actually 2010 um, that I came into the the Thai newsroom for the first time. And it was the year of the Olympics in Vancouver. I had just moved to Vancouver to start school. Um, so that was obviously a huge story and um, sort of what was going on in the city around that time and lots of protests, uh, lots of really fascinating conversations. And I had just gone through a couple of internships in um, newsrooms like the Globe and Mail and the CBC. And so, um, and, you know, people were stressed. It was a stressful time for journalism. It was two years after the major crisis and people were uh, wondering what the heck to do. Are we pivoting to video? What is social media? How are we going to cover this Olympics? You know, it was a really great time to be in journalism in some ways, but in other ways, terrifying and uncertain. So I, when I finally walked into the Thai newsroom, I had been into, I'd been in some traditional newsrooms um, and I had no idea what to expect. And I, like, I still remember that moment of walking in so clearly. It was a really big office in Vancouver's Chinatown, which we were obviously priced out of a few years later. But um, I walked in and it was, 10 a.m. on a Monday and there were two people sitting there smiling at me and you know kind of slowly drinking their coffee and I walked in I didn't really know who I was supposed to report to or what I was going to be doing and it was just so different from what I expected it was a much more casual place and then as sort of the day unfolded I did eventually figure out who I was reporting to and we all went out for dim sum um, for our Monday editorial meeting. And it quickly became clear to, clear to me that this was a group of people that was really interested in craft and really interested in their own passions, their own work, what they were specifically writing about. Everyone at the Thai at the time was a, pretty much a beat reporter. So working on one specific issue. And what surprised me was just how collaborative and supportive the group was. I mean, it was, I expected people barking at each other and yelling on the phone. And I don't, I don't even know what I, you know, I, I'd seen movies and I'd been in like two newsrooms, but it was a totally different experience. And that spirit, that really guild mentality um, of the Thai was, you know, immediately clear to me. And um, I knew that I wanted to be a part of it long-term. So, so that was sort of an, an eye-opening experience because I realized there were alternatives to 
the sort of hectic daily newsrooms um, that were honestly really in crisis by that time anyway. And as we know, that crisis continued. So you, you come in at like a very turbulent time. You see people are kind of operating in maybe a different thing, a different way than you're expecting almost. And you're kind of learning and absorbing as, as you go. Um, I think we're already starting to get questions kind of coming in. And there was one question from Sandra that's talking about like, you know, we've mentioned that there's a, when we'll talk about this more, the focus on trying to diversifying the voices in the Thai, on the Thai's pages. So Sandra says, thank you so much for your commitment to hear from diverse voices. Um, and then has a real a sort of a specific question about uh, specific groups of folks and, and how can we highlight them? And I feel because this question will probably come up a lot, um, it's people looking for commitment to, to talking about different groups of, of folks. Maybe you could talk a little bit more broadly about what makes a Thai story and how your early time at the Thai informed what you see as a Thai story now. Yeah, I think, I think the Thai back then, um, it was, it's similar to how it was now. I mean, it's a regional publication. So we're trying to cover British Columbia, but like, you know, really the lower mainland um, and the island and the politics of it, the people who live here. It was a, it was a very political publication. We are still are very political. Um, but, you know, that was generally we covered politics mainly. Um, and uh, that has sort of evolved over the years as the team has grown, as new people have come on with new interests, and certainly as our budget has grown and expanded. Now we kind of see ourselves more as um, more of a general interest magazine for the area. That doesn't mean that we don't have any political coverage. On the contrary, we still have the best political reporters on the West Coast. Obviously, I think that. Um, but we have really grown into different areas and, you know, diversifying the the Thai means diversifying who writes for the Thai, uh, who has access to the platform, but also, yeah, what we cover, how we cover it, who we feature, who we hire to take photos, who we hire to do illustrations. It's a huge, um, it's a huge undertaking. And I think, you know, my, um, the greatest part about being in my role now is when I came on board as the editor in chief in 2015, you know, and I had sort of the you know, I always felt like I had a, a say at the Taiyi, but when I had real decision-making power, um, in the last five years, we've grown so much and uh, our supporters have grown so much that we have been able to be more intentional about growing the Taiyi in all those ways. And um, it's definitely a priority for me. And I have a really wonderful group of people at the Taiyi who are also committed to that. So I'm happy to talk more about that later, if that would be of interest. Well, and that's then, yeah, we'll think we'll keep, we'll talk towards that for sure. And that'll be, that's a, like an ongoing conversation uh, as it is for a lot of organizations in particular now. And the, the idea of what makes a Thai story, and you, you mentioned having a conversation with a photographer about diversifying photos. Could you talk about that as just like one example of how you can diversify things? Because I thought that was such an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I have, there's a wonderful photographer who works for us, um, uh, who I won't mention because she probably didn't want this conversation aired publicly uh, with her name attached to it. But she just pointed out when we were, we've been talking about diversifying the Thai, and we've been really focused on bringing in new writers and trying to help them develop in a, in a really safe place with a lot of experienced people. Um, but one thing I'd really overlooked early on is sort of the, the photo side of things. And, you know, all publications, um, pretty much every publication uh, has access to affordable photos through a pool, uh, the Canadian press pool. And, you know, she was just pointing out that a lot of those photographers are men that there's, I'm not, you know, I'm not totally sure on this, but I don't think there's a single photographer on the West Coast for Canadian press who is a woman, um, you know, it, in any case, it's very few. And, you know, I just started noticing things like that and thinking, you know, we can probably do something to help increase representation on who takes our photos too. So, um, yeah. And I mean, you know, what makes a Thai story? That's, that's sort of a related conversation. 
Um, but, you know, I am finding that more and more that the new voices we bring in are really expanding the way I think about the Tai and think about who it's for and think about what it's representing. Um, and, you know, there's so many examples to me of people that have joined the Tai in the last few years, one of them being Christopher Chung, who was the first three things guest, um, who came in with, you know, a really specific beat, really specific area of interest, urban planning, um, sort of the sociology of the city is what he calls it. And really like representing the full diversity of who lives here. And he has just added a huge new audience for us, people who are super fascinated by that world, love his work. And, um, you know, there's so many people like him that we we bring in at the Tai or who we could be bringing in at the Tai. And that's really, you know, a great, um, a great joy of mine in this role. That's, and that's a great segue to the next question, which happens to be from my mom. And I'm hesitant to ask it because I want to leave room for your mother. For my mom. So I went. Wendy, please ask the questions. My mom will take uh, all the questions phase otherwise. Um, so she asks, as the editor, how do you determine what is the balance and range of stories? What areas are a given to include? And what are some of the more difficult choices you have to make to include or to not include in the publication? That's a great question. Um, you know, we do have, we still have B Reporter. I think it's Sheila, right? Yeah. Sheila, thank you for that question. Um, so keen. Yeah, it's, it, it is a, a tough, that's a very tough part of the job. Um, you know, we, we still, like I mentioned, we did have beat reporters for a long time and we still do. Um, we still have dedicated political reporters. Um, you know, we choose our, we, we choose our beats based on what we think isn't getting enough representation in other media. So that's another thing that the Tai tries to do is just be, be, uh, a space where, you know, things that aren't being talked about adequately in major media can be aired out. Um, so, you know, that's why we added a health reporter this year, because we realized there's very few dedicated health reporters on the West Coast. Meanwhile, you know, the West Coast is suffering a huge opioid crisis. Um, there's, you know, several institutions here producing some great medical research. And of course, the pandemic, I mean, we didn't predict that, but that was very useful to have a health reporter pre-pandemic. Um, so, you know, we just added a downtown east side reporter because there's nobody dedicated to covering that very, um, very special community that uh, it has, you know, been struggling with the same issues for many years. And we felt like, especially in a pandemic, it was necessary to have eyes on the street full time. Um, so yeah, we try to pick, pick the holes that are sort of missing. Um, we try to go deep on things we know really matter to our readers, things like issues of equity, um, inequality, uh, climate change is a huge one. Um, you know, I'm really, I would love to add a full-time justice reporter, somebody covering the justice system, and that's a goal of mine uh, in the next few years. Um, yeah, and then I think when people look at the Tai and see what we publish, they, they tend to think that we want more of what we currently cover, but actually, no, I'm always looking for people to fill in you know, the other spaces that exist. So um, yeah, that's why we are very happy to have a huge freelance pool. Um, and, you know, lots of people that we work with that are really specialized in certain areas. Um, but yeah, I love, I love feedback from readers on sort of what we're covering and what we're not covering enough of. And we really do read it all and we take it into account. So it's yeah. True. So send your emails our way. And those emails, will Sheila. Be read. Yep. <laughs> Don't tempt her. All right. <laughs> this is a this is another comment from Stephen or question uh, that says the comment threads give one a sense the, of the Thai readership, but perhaps it's a deceptive one. These are just the most vocal readers, perhaps. Uh, how do you get a real sense of the Thai readership? Yeah, the comment threads. Um, you know, we've got like a lot of media, um, we've gone back and forth on whether we should keep them or not. But you know, the Thai comment thread has, has, um, maybe I'm too sentimental about it, but it has a huge history. Uh, in the early days, you know, our comment thread was pretty novel. And there was a lot, there were a lot more people who were identifying themselves um, with their re real identities, with their real names. And they built wonderful relationships with each other. We built relationships with them. You know, we've even eulogized one of our, you know, most prolific and most beloved commenters, Ed Deke. Um, 
so, you know, and for a while, I, we just saw a lot of positivity in those threads along with the negativity. So we thought it was worth investing in, moderate them. And we have two uh, wonderful moderators at the Tai, uh, Ala and Tara, who, who work on that to try to keep the threads civil. But yeah, I think people are not using them as much as they used to. And that's too bad because I did, you know, I, I, I think there was a lot of value and I still think there is a lot of value. Uh, to comments, um, you know, it's a way for people to directly respond to the story. Uh, people who are in the story, for example, or politicians have engaged in the past and that's positive. Um, but yeah, I mean, we know we have a much bigger audience beyond the comment thread and, you know, it is our policy to keep the comment thread respectful, I should say. So we do our best to do that. Um, but yeah, we communicate to our readers in all different ways. I mean, they email me a lot. We have um, different ways that people can access us. You know, our emails are readily available. Uh, we do surveys every few years to find out who's reading us, you know, details about them, how they like to get us, what they like, what they don't like. Um, yeah, and we, and we used to do a lot of in-person events too, which was a great way to meet people in at least the lower mainland. Um, but yeah, I mean- I remember events events oh. <laughs> that, was, that was nice Bye. yeah they were I mean that was just so wonderful to meet people who read the Tai uh in real life so um yeah anyway I think we actually uh have published some stories about our audience too and we're going to be sharing some stories soon about some of our builders who've been with us for a long time and why they support the Tai so hopefully that will be a way for people to get to know their fellow readers as well thanks on a different ongoing conversation of kind of the community around around the news, which is so nice. And we're kind of jumping into sort of the present of the Tai, where things are at. Um, and there's a question from Natasha that says, do you have a sense of whether your su suggestions to the federal government for funding and sustaining contemporary media formats and models have been taken on board? And this is referencing a few years ago when you made a very impassioned plea basically to uh, sort of the government in terms of like, hey, this landscape is struggling. We don't want your, our hands held, but we do need some sort of shift. How are you gonna support it? Um, and Natasha goes on to ask, do you have a preferred funding model, sustainability model that stands out? The UK Guardian seems to ha handle, have a handle more or less on a way forward. Yeah, I mean, I our model is working great right now, but um, you know, it hasn't always. And I think we have really found, um, I, I truly think the, the, you know, the best model is a reader or subscription model. Um, you know, we, our, our builder model isn't, um, it's not a paywall, but it's people who, you know, just believe in what the TAI does and want to contribute to it, similar to how the Guardian operates. Um, the Guardian is supported by a major trust. We have a major investor, um, two major investors, Eric and Christina. And, um, and so this balance of uh, the investor sort of stabilizing the TAI and, you know, our investors were really interested in coming aboard a few years ago because they really believed in the reader funding model and they wanted to see how far we could push it. And so um, that's sort of what we're doing now is just trying to um, build our builder base as much as we can, because that really is uh, the best model for independence, um, independent journalism and sustainability. And, you know, if one person doesn't like what you write one day, you know, it's okay um, because there's a whole other group of people who, are interested in seeing what you do and where you go next. So that's, um, that to me, I think is a, is a great model. Uh, I mean, it's working for us. Um, in terms of the government support, I think, yeah, I mean, my specific suggestions were pretty lofty at the time, um, but, you know, definitely we've seen some movement. Um, you know, what I say and what our publisher Jeanette say on this front will probably be a little bit different. Um, Jeanette's much more plugged into the nuances of things that would help the TAI, like getting the tax status, becoming a nonprofit and getting a tax status um, as a qualified donee through their news program. So there's a lot of like technical things going on. For me, um, I have really we have really benefited from the local journalism initiative, which is a federal fund um, where you can apply for a reporter for a specific area or um, geographic area or topic area. So that's how we hired Moira, who is our health reporter, and Jen, who is our downtown east side reporter. And they provide the salary funding, and obviously we provide everything else um, 
and you know all the editing and mentorship and there's no involvement from the federal government after after sort of the here you go here's here's the funding for your new reporter um and i have to say that has been wonderful and all that reporting is pooled and can be published anywhere so it's also a boon for sort of smaller publications who um you know just want to build up sort of their audience and build up their product a little bit. Um, they can republish Jen's pieces anytime as long as they credit it. So, you know, that's been, that's been great for the Thai. Um, you know, I still think journalism is in serious trouble. Um, yeah. And I, I think, you know, the thing that gives me hope is that the Thai has been innovating on this for, you know, almost two decades and, you know, ours has never been a story of explosive growth. It's been slow and steady, but I think that's, um, that's truly the way forward for media. It, you don't have to get giant to be good um, and to be useful. And, you know, I think that's actually probably part of the problem is the, the sort of leap to be, to be giant. So, yeah, we have these monolithic uh, media corps and, um, you know, I don't want them, I don't want journalists to lose their jobs, but they still are. And we haven't come up with, you know, a credible solution. I think as Paul, Paul Wilcox really uh, said well in his, briefings interview so well and yeah. I, I think there's also the the piece too people are looking at the guardian now and going like oh reader funded it's a it's a good model but I know that you know folks at the Thai and you and Jeanette starting sort of in 2015 uh, working together we're really trying to test and work and tinker and see what is it is it going to be ad revenue this way is it going to be you know what are we doing so I know there's been a lot of trial and error before I showed up certainly to get to the point where we can say, okay, we've got something that's working and we're looking on tinkering with it to fine tune it rather than like, do we need a whole new horse? I don't have a good metaphor metaphor there. <laughs> a whole new horse, good. New horse. Usually we stick with the fish metaphors and I, I really jumped ship on that one. Horses today. <laughs> so um, there's, uh, Sharon has a question here as well. And she says, thank you for the coverage you've given the childcare chaos that still exists in BC for families with young children. I hope we see more coverage on the provincial, federal and indigenous issues relating to building a childcare system. The $10 a day plan childcare is political. Um, so that's just Sharon saying thank you. And it's it's great. I mean, we, we can have a lot of comments like that where there's there's a lot of different issues that come up on the tie and people are like, yes, thank you. That was finally the thing I wanted to see. Mm -hmm. um, now, Wendy Tilford has a question and she says, the Thai appeals to a national and global audiences as well. Can you talk about that, please? Uh, sorry, a global, and I was just distracted because this is my mom's question and I yeah. need to <laughs> a lot of pressure. Um, yes. Just talking, so, the, it's, it's a regional magazine with right. a national and global audiences. Yes. How do you manage kind of that focus? You'd think that we prepare this question in advance, but really I, she just took me by surprise. Um, no, that's, that, that's a good way of just talking about the Thai, um, because yeah, we do have a big Ontario presence specifically in Alberta. We do have coverage of those areas. Um, you know, the way we think about it is, um, you know, Vancouver is sort of the is sort of the core of where we are, um, because it's a city that has a lot of uh, obviously huge issues that repeat or are seen elsewhere in other big cities, especially Canadian cities like Toronto. So things like, you know, our housing crisis and our drug crisis, drug overdose crisis and um you know, like being sort of the fore of climate change as a coastal city. So there's a lot of major issues that like cities elsewhere, including Canada, are really fascinated in. So we try to do a lot of Thai stories rooted in this place, but of interest to others, you know, on my best day, I want the Thai to feel like the New Yorker, right? Like you want to read about New York, um, but, and you want to, you want to read about the issues happening in this massive, you know, city with a lot of power and interest, a lot of dynamics. And it's the same in Vancouver. It's the same in Toronto. Um, we do a lot of federal coverage too, because obviously that affects British Columbia and affects this area. Um, and so, you know, when we do coverage from those areas, we try to keep in mind, how does this affect the people who live here? Um, you know, our readers are definitely, you know, progressive. Uh, a lot of them identify as, um, well, we have readers across the political spectrum, but people who are interested in solutions and progressive politics. So, you know, 
that's what we would cover federally too. Um, you know, so we just had a piece on um, the provincial greens that probably had a lot of interest to the green party, green party members sort of federally across the country. Um, and of course we have Michael Harris, you know, one of our columnists who uh, is actually based on the East coast, but covers uh, Ottawa and sort of a, from a columnist analyst role. And, you know, he just fits with the tie because his perspective is utterly independent. Um, just the right and, amount of salty. Yes. Yeah. He's got a bit of salt to him. Um, yeah. So, so hopefully that answers a little bit. And yeah, we have a lot of readers from outside of Canada too, especially along uh, the West coast. So, you know, sort of Seattle, Portland, California. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, uh, it's great. Well, here's a quick hit spicy question from Erwin. How do you relate to the national observer, rival or collaborator? <laughs> wow. Yeah. Uh, that's... Zing, zing, zing. <laughs> no, of course we have a huge respect for the national observer. I mean, it's really hard to make a go of it in independent media. Um, it's really hard. And, you know, full respect to Linda for building a team over there out of, nothing i mean you know these things the start starting up is so hard um and yeah we've we've shared stories before and definitely um you know we always like to feature observer stories on our front page in our reported elsewhere section and yeah i mean you know i think among any media not just small independent media but in your media there's of course an element of competition you know um because that's just sort of the way you know you you want to kind of get things first. It's sort of an, an uh, journalist intuition, um, or I guess instinct. Um, but, you know, I'm also heartened by the amount of collaboration now that people are engaged in. And certainly we're doing a lot of, we've done a lot of collaboration in the past few years, especially. And, you know, ultimately it comes down to what serves a story. And, um, and yeah, competition doesn't often serve a story. It, it's usually better to work together and and um, so, yeah, hopefully we'll see more of that in the next while, too. I think it's the same in stand up comedy. Anytime you see someone tell a joke that you wish you thought yeah. of first, you're like nuts. Yeah. Respect. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Good, job. Good job. I got to work harder. So um, sort of we've kind of touched in the past and a little bit of the present. What's what's happening with the tie now and going into the future? I think there's a question that kicks us off nicely in, uh, for Peter. And he said, um, could you tell more about outreach to community groups and sectors like labor, women, environmental, anti-poverty and so on, and how you invite their suggestions uh, and sort of integrate them with reporters? Um, so again, another question a little bit about sort of the commitment from the TAI about how you're covering different voices and different perspectives that are not always represented in traditional media. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the outreach part of it is really important. And, you know, I, we do rely a lot on our reporters to do um, a lot of that work, right? Because they know the people who are, um, who are considered the experts in their area, or they know the people with lived experience um, making those connections. So, um, but yeah, that, I mean, I think it's really important to dedicate time to that as an editor, um, to sort of connecting with people and um, talking about sort of what's being missed uh, by other media. And, you know, one thing I'm really excited about is um, Ala, who is currently our editorial assistant, Ala Olanian is becoming an associate editor in the next few months and his job will be to um, pretty much solely seek out new voices uh, to appear on the TIE and work with new writers, um, not necessarily new writers, but people who um, we haven't heard from in a while who are talking about things that are important but we're not featuring enough of and working with them to get their, their voices on the site, whether it's their stories getting reported by a Thai reporter or whether they're doing the work themselves, they're doing the writing themselves. Um, so that's, that's sort of a big, uh, that's something I'm pretty excited about. And, you know, I hope that, you know, it may not always be clear, but the Thai is very open um, to suggestions and it's pretty easy to access all of us, all of our information's on our contact page. Uh, our submission system needs a bit of uh, a refresh, but um, yeah, we're really, we're really reachable. And, you know, I like to think quite communicative. So um, they're quite responsive. So yeah, hopefully if people do want to reach out to us, you know, we're there for it. Yeah. And I think that it's like anything, you know, keep 
people have ideas and keep pitching and anytime there's like always the risk of rejection which is scary and you know not everything gets published like you said you have to make choices at some point but um yeah it's definitely i get the feeling an organization that uh, wants to wants to hear from folks now i know kind of kind of we'll circle back and end on this you started as an intern at the tai you began editing interns work when you started working for us and then last year you had a record high of i think 12 interns coming in doing their their the practicums and things um for their for their journalism programs so what is it that is so exciting and inspiring about working with the journalists that are just training up now for you yeah, I mean, I just think of my experience at the TAI and I want everyone else who comes through to hit through here to have like some semblance of what I got to experience. You know, I, I, I mean, when I was there, I worked, you know, once I figured out David Beers was my um, person I reported to, um, you know, he became a really special and important mentor to me and gave me um, so much hope about the industry and also just you know, so much time, invested so much time in me to make me better. And I think, you know, if you're coming in as a practicum student, this, you know, this is often your first time in a newsroom and I want it to be really positive for people. I want it to be, feel really collaborative, right? Hey, you're busy, you're an editor, you got, that, that's that newsroom thing. That's that West Wing um, fast talking thing that's happening in newsrooms. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, so, Basically, I just want to give people the same experience. And I think, okay, this is getting high stress world out here. <laughs> um, so I think, yeah, want to give people that same experience. And, um, you know, I really um, am impressed. By... <laughs> Emma. This is the best. I'm Emma, sorry, but I'm there's gonna... a rule in comedy with threes. Is so that got cool? three there? That was good. Um, okay. You know, I would love to turn this off. If it happens again, I'm going to turn it off. I'm sorry. It's, we're almost done. We're almost done. Please it's stop less. calling me if you're watching <laughs> this and you're trolling me. Um, yes. So, and and the the journalists, the journalism students today are like so collaborative and so um, so keen to yeah dive into topics that like you know people when I was a journalism student weren't really covering and doing it in different ways, running with more voice. Uh, so yeah, I just, to me, it's one of the greatest parts of my job too, is working with um, practicum students. It's, it's always joy when they walk in at the beginning of the summer and so sad when they leave. And, you know, I have a million stories about amazing practicum students. I wish I could just, we could do a separate on my 24 my hour live stream yeah. fundraiser situation yeah <laughs> you'll yeah. regret but you promised to do that totally but like they they give me so much hope for the future of the industry um and you know i really hope that the the future of journalism looks like them because um yeah it's going to be really fun and really smart and yeah successful so yeah well, let's, let's end on that. And uh, Michelle had a question about, I'm new to the magazine. What does Thai mean? So this is the <laughs> ultimate test as the editor. What is your quick hit answer? For uh, what? what is yeah, it? Well, so the Thai is um, a name for the king, like a king salmon. Um, it's a new channel word. And um, it's, yeah, it has a lot of, it has a lot of spiritual meaning to uh, that first nation but um, it's it's also kind of used to describe a certain sort of salmon, like a really large king sa king size salmon or queen size salmon, big salmon. And you know we liked it because um, I, you know we swim against the current. That's what salmon's do. Uh, we try to do uh, what everyone else isn't doing and cover what people other people aren't covering. Um, and yeah, the fish metaphors abound on the site. So enjoy so it. You get to know the diet. <laughs> Well, thank you for uh, leading, us, leading us as we swim upstream. And thank you for this conversation. And our last three things interview will be next week with Crawford Killian. So tune in then. And thanks again, Robin. Thank you, Emma. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.